The Golf Book Green Cathedral Dreams by Robert Suda Hamilton This is a book about golf, and in particular, why the game of golf is so special. It is a book about why I love the game, and why it has captured my passion and imagination. Golf is unlike most other sporting contests, in that you play primarily against the course and to a lesser extent against your playing partners and other competing golfers. The lie of the land challenges you from the opening tee shot until the final putt drops. The golf ball is not moving around when you come to play your shot and so appears to benignly beckon you to strike it. The ground, however, may not be flat beneath your feet and slopes are common all over the course. The face of the club head and golf ball are relatively small surfaces, especially when you draw back the club head on a lengthy shaft until it is behind your head. Returning the face of the club head square to the back of the ball at speed is no easy task for the beginner at the game of golf. It is not uncommon to feel some anxiety about successfully striking this smallish golf ball from beyond shoulder height. Success being measured in terms of the golf ball travelling toward your intended target and not at some other dangerous angle and direction to who knows where. Golf can be a humbling experience, especially for those just starting out on their golfing journey. The beginner can meet many golfers unexpectedly during a round of golf as they follow their errant ball across unscheduled fairways in the wake of wicked slices and horrendous hooks. One can feel like a fool multiple times and must grin and bear it. The lure of the perfectly struck drive or tee shot can overcome these blips on your golfing radar, however. Many of us become hooked on golf like no other sport. The fact that we can keep playing this great game beyond our youth is another big plus. My intention in writing this book is to get inside some of the magical moments and some of the more humorous aspects of the game of golf. There is an undeniable communing with nature flavour underpinning the game of golf, where the field of play is so massive, massive and majestic. Mother Nature with a manicure is how Loudon Wainwright III put it so poignantly in his song, The Back Nine. He tells us, in this game you've got 18 holes to shoot your best somehow. Where have all my divots gone? I'm in the back nine now. I got to move on down to that next fairway, up to that flapping flag. There's a storm forming overhead. I got to shoulder up that bag. He goes on to talk about clubs and magic wands. This can sound a bit Harry Potterish in this day and age, but perhaps there is a correlation here. Wood and iron were the old materials used in the making of golf clubs and represented half of the traditional medieval four elements that were thought to make up all things. I can see the young Loudon carrying his father's golf bag and feel the nascent connection between dad and son that play on the golf course. The golf course can be a rare opportunity for children to play with their adult parents at a game on a fairly level playing field. Golf is probably the only sport you can compete at with a wide variety of abilities and ages. Many of us are now on the back nine in terms of our lives and span of allotted years. Golf has always been a willing repository of many metaphors for life. The patience required to play the game of golf is more analogous than with fast and furious sporting contests. Golf can be played for a long time, indeed a lifetime. The feeling that we are way over par as we journey to the back half captures some of the disappointment that many of us feel in relation to our lives sometimes. We all start out so full of hope and spend a lifetime coming to terms with what life serves up to us and how we respond. A round of golf is very like that if you tune into the moods of your playing partners. Hopeful and buoyant at the beginning and then the mishits and misdirected shots mount up. As the early holes fill up with bogeys and missed putts, the balloon deflates somewhat. Golf becomes a grind, and a good score something to eck out. It is a Scottish game, after all, and the Scots are famous for their careful ways with money. It is very easy to waste shots in golf. If you do not concentrate and allow loose strokes to be lost, they soon add up. Honesty is paramount in the game of golf. 
This puts the game on a different footing from many other sports in the modern era where winning is everything. If you cheat at golf, you are only cheating yourself. You will develop a reputation for it and other golfers will not want to play with you. Counting all your shots and strokes is the bedrock upon which the game is built. Playing the ball as it lies is another fundamental principle of the game of golf. This is why we still have this ridiculous situation regarding divots and having to play out of them, whether your ball lies on fairway or rough. I personally regard the divot situation on the fairway as carrying this play it, play it as it lies ethos way too far. Golf is special in no small part because it is a deeply unfair game. You get plenty of bad breaks in the game of golf and you just have to suck it up. These unfortunate bounces and unlucky lies make the sweet stuff all the more sweeter when things turn your way. Golf is an amazing game because it is played over such a large field of play. The arena where we contest the game is far bigger than most other sports. Magic happens in the midst of Mother Nature. The fresh air and the flora and fauna we share the course with. Bird song serenades our play. Life abounds all around. Take the time every now and then to breathe deeply on course and take in the pulsating life all around you. Golf is a special game. The Golf Book, Green Cathedral Dreams The Opening Drive Let me begin by saying that all those who play the great game of golf are blessed by the experience inside the Green Cathedral. There is nothing quite like cracking a big drive down the fairway off the tee, watching that ball rise in the air and hurtle vast distances to land safely is a sweet affair indeed. Rolling in a putt, from an unlikely place on the green is another deeply satisfying element of the game of golf. To the uninitiated, striking a stationary small white sphere from its grassy lie with a club often seems no remarkable feat. However, ask them to reproduce that achievement, and what follows can involve much cursing and frustrating failure. Golf is not an easy game to master, and therein lies its fascination for millions around the globe. Golf gives us a clearly defined mission. Walking the fairways inside this green cathedral, breathing fresh air and feeling alive is the foundation of playing the game of golf. On top of this comes a host of highs and lows, hits and misses and accrued scores. Life on the links pits us against nature while simultaneously being in its lively embrace. In my view, golf gives us a clearly defined mission with a set of rules to play by firmly in place. Modern life outside of the course can often lack this certainty. Having a finite number of clubs, 14, with which to meet the challenges of the game confers such certainty. 18 holes, each with tee and green, sets the stage. Lines marking boundaries and hazards define the area of play. Bunkers governed by strict rules. These are all demarcations by which to golf by. Golf is an elemental challenge. Wild and manicured beauty emanates from golf courses. Some have majestic trees, whilst others are bare and windblown. Some courses are bordered by water in a variety of forms. Nature is an essential component of golf course architecture. The green cathedral is large and can involve a labyrinth of tree-lined fairways and pathways. There is often an undefined element of magic in the air. I close my eyes and imagine a lone golfer with 14 clubs in his or her quiver. This individual seeks a round with the fewest number of shots played. The light filters through green foliage and casts shadows across the ground. Birdsong and the buzz of insects provide an enchanted ambience. Goals are at the forefront of mind. Process is practiced via a pre-shot routine, especially over delicate chips and putts. Breaths are taken consciously in a bid to remain, relaxed in the face of possible adversity. A golfer's journey is long in terms of the temporal athletic contest. This is a marathon and not a sprint toward a crown of olive leaves. Par is the recognised standard number of shots required to play each hole and the course in aggregate. Par derives from the same Latin source as parity and means something similar, par for the course. Golf history tells us that the term par was taken from the stock market and applied to the ground score in golf in the 1890s. Golf was largely played by the wealthy at its outset. 
but thankfully it now has spread to a wider audience. Bogey is another term which now refers to one over par. Its provenance is Scottish like the game itself. A birdie, meaning one under par, originated from American slang around the turn of the 20th century. A bird referred to anything excellent at that time. An eagle, of course, continued the avian theme and upped the ante with the majestic eagle and its association with the United States of America. An eagle is a score of two under par on a single hole. An albatross or double eagle denotes a score of three under par on one hole. The average golfer is, it must be said, more familiar with double and triple bogeys than with any form of rare avian life. All successful subcultures have their own jargon, which is delightfully shared by its members. Golfers love to swap cliches whilst on the course as a rich part of the golfing experience. A golf ball propelled onto the green by a well-struck shot is said to be on the dance floor. A shot struck beyond the green has airmailed the green. An ace is a rare hole-in-one, and this is an exclusive club within the game of golf for those golfers who have achieved this rare feat. Golfers wanting a ball to cease its journey across the green cry out, BITE! A putt successfully rolled into the hole is drained. Alternatively, that putt could lip out and fail to remain in the hole. A duff is a mishit shot, usually a chip or pitch. A chip is a short low shot played around the green most often. A pitch is a high shot played with a wedge from around 120 metres in. A wedge is a club designed to play pitch shots due to its highly lofted club face and shorter shaft length. A poached egg is a concave lie within a sand bunker. A golfer playing well is said to be on fire. Scrambling golfers must get up and down from just off the green to par the hole. Golf demands both mental and physical applications, as it is a test of strategy and skill. The designer of the golf course utilises a number of visual perception tricks to challenge unwary golfers. Contours and inclines can take golf balls into unexpected locations and away from the sought-after target. Standing on the tee and scouting down the fairway can be frustrated by dog legs left or right. There are strategically placed hazards designed to catch misdirected shots. Our hopeful player is suddenly confronted by a sandy lie with a lip to overcome or a watery demise. Golfers must regroup and adjust their expectations from birdie to par or bogey. The Green Cathedral is not always home to aspiring spires that reach to golfing heaven. Good golf requires continual gear shifts from the fluid power of the big drive off the tee to delicate chips and putts. There are recovery shots to be played over and around trees, water and hillocks. Bunker shots to be played from sand around greens, where the knack is not to make contact with the ball, but with a cushion of sand. Pitch shots played high into well-protected greens. Low shots struck into the wind and under branches. Balls worked from right to left and from left to right. Putts rolled steeply downhill and putts struck firmly uphill breaking putts and straight putts. Think about those 14 clubs to choose from and each of them with a repertoire of shots. Decision making is a big part of the game of golf and indecision is like a black hole awaiting that next duff. A foozled chip leaves one feeling like a fool waving to the world on an exposed rock. Hitting it fat sees a large divot taken prior to making contact with the ball. There are so many things that can go wrong with your swing out on the golf course, it is a wonder that we don't end our days blubbering in some asylum. The slice is the most common golf shot observed out on the links. Golfers with driver in hand will likely slice the golf ball right of their intended target. The longest shaft in the bag measuring around 44 to 48 inches means that the driver, or one wood, clubheads are no longer made of wood but the name is stuck, is the most difficult club to properly wield. You will see more homegrown swings failing to meet the demands of the shape and dimensions of the driver than in any other aspect of the game of golf. Bastardized movements, to put it crudely, delivering steep cuts across the line and resulting in weak fades and wicked slices. Despite this ugly feature of many golfers' games, their love of golf is undiminished. Golfers live in hope of striking their ball sweetly and seeing it soar effortlessly great distances down the fairway. Curing the slice is a perennial rich source of income for golf professionals everywhere. 
Drivers and fairway woods have seen huge evolutions in design technology and materials used in their construction. Originally made from wood and steel, they have become uber light clubs created out of titanium and graphite. The distances that these clubs can launch a golf ball, when correctly struck, have doubled in the last couple of decades. They are challenging golf courses and their pars due to players being able to hit the ball so far. The golf club manufacturers produce new drivers and irons every year and generate large parts of their income via this cycle of new technologies driving sales. The elite players, the touring PGA professionals, are closely watched by an adoring audience and their achievements widely celebrated. These players regularly eagle par fives with drives reaching 350 yards and requiring just a short iron to the green. There is a growing gulf between what golf is like for the average punter and the game played by those we see on TV. Placing one of these $900 drivers in the hands of the average high handicapper sees slices travelling about 170 metres into the trees on the right of the fairway. Learning to wield the driver is a prerequisite to unlocking its incredible launch properties. Teaching golf is officially the domain of PGA professionals, but actually happens via a wide variety of mediums. The exchange of swing tips and information naturally occurs between fellow golfers of all levels. Talk of the blind leading the blind is, of course, politically incorrect in this age of the visually impaired and challenged. Golf instruction delivered through magazines and books has been a strong presence almost since the inception of the game itself. Technology has delivered instructional golf videos, especially via YouTube, which are available on large smart TVs, phones, computers and tablets. Teaching aids utilising GPS and digital camera technologies are coming to the fore now, with launch monitors delivering a host of data for those able to make sense of it all. The golf swing is analysed by science and technology to an nth of a degree. The golfer today has greater access to swing aids and help than ever before. The love of the games is enamoured for many through this layer of angles, arcs and swing speeds. The love of golf amid the Green Cathedral is often accompanied by strings of passionate self-abuse loudly expressed by players considering themselves unfortunate. The golfer, who having played a very ordinary shot, exclaims his disappointment in rich and ribald terms. I'm always surprised when this originates with the high handicapper who plays once a week and never practices. In competitive club golf, one is usually part of a four-ball group and shares the four-hour experience with these fellow competitors. Hearing blokes loudly cursing themselves for miss-hit shots right from the outset of the round is sometimes amusing and ultimately annoying. We all have bad days, of course, and I have cursed myself for the best of them on such days. Regular behaviour like this is not good for anyone's game, however. A bad day on the golf course is better than a good day in the office is another golf cliche and worth remembering in these circumstances. The thing about golf is that it often turns around if you persevere. A bad attitude on the course just makes things worse for longer, in my experience. Golf is a test of character and your sporting mettle. A test of how you can stand up to scrutiny and the individual demands of a solo game like golf. I think this is a big part of the game's appeal. Men and women enjoy the challenge of pitting themselves against the course. There is nowhere to hide during a competitive round and you only have yourself to blame when you muck it up and fall short. The legendary Bobby Jones in his early days used to throw clubs and carry on out of frustration until it was pointed out to him what a bad look poor sportsmanship was and how damaging it can be to your game. Obviously these people are passionate competitors and perhaps perfectionists which is why they get so cut up about failure in the moment. Golf demands we move on from emotional highs and lows and get on with playing the game. Four hours with three other golfers in the pressure cooker of an important competitive round can be revealing. Most of my experience has been playing golf with other men and I can hear echoes in their self-admonishments of how fathers have berated their sons and how these blokes remember these harsh words. The pain and critical condemnation rise to the surface in the wake of mishit shots. The thin chip that shoots through the green into trouble. The fat shot that falls woefully short. The hook drive out of bounds, the massive slice deep into the cabbage. A cornucopia of calamitous golf shots calling down curses upon ourselves in disgust at our own ineptitude. The humbling debasement, which is also a rich part of the golfing experience. 
Things cannot be good all the time, or we would not know the sweet taste of success in the face of overwhelming odds. The 200 metre shot to the green, which somehow gets there. The ball that bounces through the bunker and onto the green. The drive that ricochets from tree branch back into the middle of the fairway. An iron heading for disaster, which deviates at the final moment to find safe harbour somewhere near the green. All these unlikely golf shots are made all the sweeter by healthy regular doses of failure out on the links. Golf can be a humbling force for good within our characters if we appreciate our good fortune to be out there competing whatever the result. Walking the course surrounded by green grass, trees, fresh air and bird life is a win in itself. Nature is smiling upon us and we seek a repeating swing to harmonise with this grand experience. The golfer lives a good life if he or she can remember to feel blessed by the opportunity to play this great game with acquaintances, friends and loved ones. Enjoy your time amid the green cathedral of nature playing this compelling game. Why I call the golf course the green cathedral. If you have ever spent some quality time on a golf course, you'll know what I mean by my analogy with a green cathedral, especially if it is a tree-lined course with these silent sentinels reaching up toward the sky above. Walking a beautiful golf course in a moment of reverie can transport you to a special place. There is no need to be religious in a traditional sense, as this is a communion with nature, albeit with the help of some greenkeepers. I have played plenty of rounds and practice time on my own out on the course. At these times you get a sense of the peace and tranquility available on many golf courses. If you listen to golf course designers and architects speak, they often refer to their tracks as works of art. 18 holes crafted from the natural geography and the vision of these artists. We who love the game of golf are lucky enough to play upon these living art forms. Much of the time golfers are intent upon navigating their way around these layouts in as few strokes as possible and may suffer from tunnel vision to some degree. However, every now and then we look up and take the time to smell the flowers and see the beauty surrounding us. Ponds and creeks may be watery traps, but they also possess an aesthetic quality to be appreciated. Golf courses can move the human soul which is why many wedding photos are taken at particularly sublime vantage points on the course. We love the view of Augusta National at the Masters on our TV screens with its pretty flowers, bridges, ponds and soaring trees. The Green Cathedral is very much in play here. There is, I suppose, a delicious irony here, especially when our game suffers on a majestic course with all this beauty eating up our score. The golfer who has plonked his approach shot in a watery grave or watched his golf ball trickle back into a pond or creek from off the green is rarely in the mood to appreciate the beauty of the scene. We dance with potential disaster on tracks, sporting features such as these, and attempt to get our ball close without paying the ultimate price. Golf balls are relatively inexpensive in this day and age to most, excepting to our score to par that is, but a wet shot is a dampener to our hopes of a great score. The Green Cathedral is where we commune with nature with ball and clubs. We engage with the land and weather conditions in a bid to best our score and playing partners. We do so not on our knees, apart from a tricky bunker shot or maybe lining up a putt, but swinging away with hope in our hearts. We breathe in the fresh air generated by grass, plants and trees. We enjoy the sunshine on fine days and its warm glow upon our skin. Life is good. Golf is good. Is there a god in this green cathedral? The golfing gods are known to players of this great game. Perhaps golf recognises the old beliefs with a pagan leaning exhibited by many golfers in their understanding of these golfing gods. Lady Luck and the rub of the green come into play a lot on the links. Conceptions of fortune and gambling on getting a good bounce over a bad one is on display every time you set foot on the golf course for a round. Christian golfers may well reduce this pantheon to a single god in their philosophy while playing the game. Scientists would comprehend Newtonian physics at play during their 18 holes of strikes and rolls. Engineering a mechanically sound swing is a popular approach in the modern game. However, perhaps our superstitious selves emerge under pressure, as when you have to make a tricky downhill putt. Praying for divine intervention never seems to go astray for many when it's a must-make situation. 
Three men were playing golf. The course was a wicked dogleg with a large water hazard. The first man stepped up to the tee and hit a sharp slice into the water hazard. He walked up to the water. It parted, and he lofted his ball with one foot of the hole. Within one foot of the hole. The next man stepped up and hit the ball. Sure enough, he sliced it so that it landed on top of the water. He walked across the surface of the water and hit the ball within six inches of the hole. The third man stepped up, hit the ball, and sliced it. The ball was just about to land in the water when a trout jumped out of the water and grabbed it in his mouth. An eagle swooped down, scooped up the fish, and flew off. As the eagle banked over the green, lightning struck it. It dropped the fish. The fish dropped the ball, and it landed in the hole for a hole in one. Moses turned to Jesus and said, I really hate playing golf with your dad. Did Jesus really play golf? Now, I know that you know that we at Golf Dom ask all the really tough questions and get them answers on your behalf. Today, we are delving into the widely held belief that Jesus played golf and fact-checking this assumption. How do we know that many folk reckon Christ was a golfer? Quite simply, because if you have played enough rounds with enough people, you will commonly hear the refrain, Jesus Christ, or the exclamation, Oh my God! Again and again, these pleas and demands are obviously directed at someone who knows a lot about golf and could play the game to a higher standard. Did Jesus really play golf? Stay tuned to find out more here. If I had a dollar for every Christ I heard on the golf course, if I had a dollar for the number of times I've heard a golfer cry out, Oh my Lord, or Jesus H. Christ, or Christ Almighty, I would count myself a wealthy man. So where do most folks think that the Nazarene played most of his golf? Did the game of golf feature prominently among the local pastimes in Judea and Palestine? Was there a Bethlehem open on the circuit at that time? Were the apostles actually disciples of this great game of golf? Did Jesus have a great short game or was he a proponent of the long game? St. Paul tells us that, um, well, perhaps we'll go into this another time. There are so many questions raised by the idea that the Christian Messiah was a dab hand with the clubs. I imagine that Lynx Golf would be the order of the day with my conception of the terrain on this somewhat stark geography. Gnarled Judas trees were, I think, pretty thin on the ground, and bad lies would have been more than prevalent. Distance off the tee wouldn't have been a problem, I imagine, but bunkers and waste areas were most likely everywhere. The sand wedge may well have been Jesus' most trusted implement to extricate himself from tricky situations. Whether he favoured a Roman grind or less bounce is still very very much up in the air at this time. It is pretty clear that Jesus was a golfer of some rare ability. The buzz that still follows his miraculous feats on the links is testimony to this. The fact that he played with wooden clubs was obviously a cross he had to bear. Indeed, whether the current crop of Wunderkins could cross swords with a carpenter's son from Nazarene remains to be seen. The modern golf professional carries with him or her a swathe of support staff and coaches. Could they cope with the level of adversity faced by the Christian Messiah and stand up to the whole Roman Empire? Would today's golfer be able to overcome suspicions of anti-Semitism in their dealings with the Jewish Pharisees? Money lenders are big sponsors on the pro tour around the world in the 21st century, and would this be an issue for Jesus if he was playing, plying his trade on the US PGA Tour today? There are no easy answers for the big questions, as you can see. Many players of this great game would shy away from any mention of religion when it came to their golf. They would prefer to see things in terms of clubs, course and ball. When he, one of the many interesting aspects of golf is the length in terms of time it takes to play 18 holes. Some folks see golf as an anachronism due to this fact, with modern life all about instant results on a computer search screen. It is true that golf stands out in contrast to the digital applications we surround ourselves with in the 21st century. The implements with which we play golf are essentially old stuff in consideration of their technology. Most irons are still made of light steel in head and shaft. Sure, drivers, fairway clubs and hybrids are composed of graphite and titanium, but their overall concept remains pretty much the same. Swinging a club is itself old school in contrast to the labour-saving world we live in. Golf is not a push-button touchscreen activity, thank God. Walking the course, in my view, is far preferable to driving in a cart, but I understand the importance of this to those who can't walk the course. 
Swinging a golf club is an idiosyncratic craft in that we each have a unique approach to this sequence of movements. I am thankful that the swing, swing remains an integral part of the game of golf. Human innovation can remove much of what makes us human, in my view. We get so caught up in new technologies and fail to see what has fallen by the wayside. Will the golf swing survive, or will golf clubs become self-swinging by themselves? The auto-swinging shaft would, I posit, become a bestseller. Why do you play golf? Have you ever asked yourself that question, perhaps after you have unwrapped that hundredth golf-themed Christmas or birthday present, or after that round of hopeless play and scoring have left you bereft of inspiration for the game? Why do you play golf? What is it about this frustrating game that gets under your skin and keeps you returning for more? Is it the masterless nature of the beast? The fact that for every great drive down the fairway there is a duffed iron or foozled chip. Eighteen holes of golf provides plenty of time and opportunity for you to fail and fall well short of your handicap or personal best score. The length of time demanded by this testing game means more concentration is needed than most of us can manage. Reasons to consider for playing golf. Of course, every now and then we surprise ourselves with one, of, one out of the box and a winning score. A collection of shots adds up to something better than the norm. However, closer evaluation of rounds played will usually show more bad than good. A greater investment of time and money than the results can really justify if your accountant was to examine the evidence. Why then do we continue to play this game of golf? Are we masochists by nature? Do we enjoy the savage beating that this game can apply? Or are we so starved of glory in our ageing lives that we take what little we can get? It could be a little of all of these things. Pondering the elements of the game of golf. There are 14 clubs in the bag and a large body of land demanding a volume of different kinds of shots. There is fresh air and exercise to be had. There is green grass and the sounds of nature all around. There is the camaraderie of playing with your mates. All of these elements contribute to the reason why we play golf. For some, it is an escape from the complexities of modern life, a change-up from the continual concerns of making money, a retreat from human relationships at the centre of our lives, the narrow focusing of manoeuvring a small white sphere around a golf course frees many for those four-plus hours spent on course. Sometimes the strict rules of golf, so clearly defined, provide further relief from the exponential ambiguities of real life. There is a job to be done on the golf course, and 14 tools to utilise as you go about it. Perhaps it is what golf is, not as a pastime which makes it so attractive to many. Is this the zen nature of the game of golf? Why do you play golf? Will asking this question and finding some answers cast a refreshing light upon your existence? Could it actually contribute to improving your golf? Conversely, you may have the attitude that your, yours is not to question why, but rather you merely have to do and die. Don't think, do. Get out of your head and into your hands and feet. Play golf and leave the thinking to the philosophers. It takes all sorts. We play golf for so many different reasons. It may be for the company of good friends and the on-course camaraderie. There is no denying that this is a rich source of satisfaction for many, with the jibes and jokes between friends and fellow competitors striking a chord. It is very easy to make a fool of yourself while swinging that darn golf club at times. Having so-called mates on hand to rib you and rub it in is all part of the great game of golf. A game of golf over four-plus hours can be like a dip into an unfamiliar water hole. Sometimes it is a doddle and things come easy. At other times, however, it is deep and slippery with problems rearing up like alligators out of nowhere. Suddenly you are confronted by a steep stance with a really bad lie and the requirement of hitting your golf ball over a vast expanse of wasteland or water. The bad times during your round can tempt you into quitting and walking away, but mostly we don't. Things then smooth out and you hit a good shot and or get a good result. Very soon you are playing some decent golf and enjoying your day on the links. In this manner, golf is a refreshing experience over the entire round because you overcome challenges to get through and prevail. Modern life in front of a digital screen does not have the same demand or impact upon us. Some golfers dream of playing like Tiger Woods or Phil Mickelson. 
It used to be dreams of playing like Greg Norman and Jack Nicholas. There is something about cracking a fine drive down the middle of a fairway or launching a soaring high pitch to the flag on the green. Golf gets us thinking about unearthly things via the aerodynamics of a well-struck golf ball. It is no surprise that the best scores share avian names like eagles, albatrosses and birdies. Golf played well encourages us to dream of the highest heights and the unlikeliest of feats achieved. Mountain climbers and space adventurers, high divers and sky divers are all touched upon in some way when we transport our golf balls prodigious distances. There is the green grass below and the wide skies above. There are tall trees reaching to the heavens. There are dams and abysses to cross. The journey of the golfer is a microcosm in many ways of the explorer and adventurer from our past. We must launch our golf balls over vast tracts of land to reach targeted areas on the course. Of course, a struck tree can bring your hopes quickly to ground, dashing thoughts of eagles and birdies with a clunk before dropping behind a nasty trunk. The dreamer is brought to earth with all thoughts of tiger or fill dissipating like smoke. And yet, the once-in-a-lifetime recovery shot can resurrect these golf hero dreams again. Memories of amazing shots seen on TV covering the Masters or Open. Our favourite touring pro golfer comes to mind as we assess the situation behind that tree. Green cathedral dreams gather force like clouds of incense prior to a miracle being performed. Religion has moved to the sporting arena for its freakish feats of imagination. Jordan Spieth performing short game wizardry before his adoring fans. Dustin Johnson and Bryson DeChambeau launching enormous drives beyond the ken of mere mortals like you and I. Young golfers stretching their sinewy tendons and built-up muscles to strike shots incredible distances with clubs designed for far less than the hands of you and me. We can all daydream about being a pro golfer on tour. We can imagine the fast cars and beautiful women, the awards and triumphs captured by cameras beaming the footage around the globe. The lifestyle of spending our time outdoors on the golf course with smiling fellow golfers. Of course, the grass is always greener especially on the golf course. We do not think about the endless hours of practice on the range and putting green. We do not dwell on the missed cuts and intense moments of failure, the waiting and more waiting on tour to play rounds and shots, the intense competition for a few places at the top of the tree, the working out to keep pace without your direct competition, the doubts and negative emotions swirling around like bad weather ready to curtail your round. No, our golf dreams are confined to the good stuff we imagine the pro golfer life to entail. The Golfing Gods We live in a scientific age where everything is measured and recorded digitally. The idea that there might exist such things as golfing gods is, of course, absurd. But is it? For all those who venture upon the first tee with a golf club in hand, a silent mumble or murmur of, say a little prayer for me, is not totally out of character. You see, the very act of sending a small white ball hurtling over vast distances is a pretty big risk in itself. Entreaties to the golfing gods at the beginning of a round are firmly in the great human tradition of doing deals with deities battling the course like golfers. If you want to understand the human fascination with religion, a quick glance back into the pages of history will suffice. There are a hell of a lot of kings with armies calling upon gods to bestow victory upon them over their enemies. Soldiers on the eve of battles quickly become superstitious in the face of their likely impending death. Similarly, golfers are about to go into battle with the golf course as they survey the scene from the vantage of the first tee. If you have watched a golfing newbie go about his or her business on the tee, you will comprehend what I mean by this. The amount of time taken addressing the ball is akin to prayer. These players seem frozen intently before they are willing to pull the trigger and take back the club to begin their swing. God's rub of the green. 
The golfing gods, like the more well-known invisible supernatural entities of the world's main religions, exist in a parallel universe only accessible to the believer. Their actions are legible via the resultant journey of a player's golf ball, commonly referred to as the rub of the green. These fortunate and unfortunate bounces and other detours imbue the game of golf with mystical overtones. A golfer swings an iron club with a specifically designed head and face with which to strike a small dimpled ball. Scientists and engineers see this process in purely physical terms, involving calculations about velocity, mass and launch angles. The common garden variety golfer, however, is regularly amazed at the flight of the golf ball and its direction. This contributes greatly to the game's obsessive fascination and grip upon his or her consciousness. Why else would a grown man or woman spend vast amounts of time and money on such a ridiculous pursuit? Golfers and gravity. The golfer pits her or his will against the physical universe and the law of gravity. The premise of the game is predicated upon covering physical distance in the least number of strikes prior to rolling a small ball, ball into a smallish hole 18 times. The golfer is armed with 14 different clubs with which to achieve this mission or challenge. The round of golf frequently takes in excess of four plus hours. The competing players are dealing with distance, time and the vagaries of geography and weather. No wonder that these doughty human beings are susceptible to the odd silent prayer to the golfing gods. Prayer and putting. Putting is another realm where prayers are regularly invoked to the golfer's cause. Here we see the golfer having achieved his or her aim of making the green, now faced with the tricky situation of sinking the putt. The Herculean task of transporting the small white sphere, perhaps over half a kilometre, is over. But a more mercurial challenge still remains. Greens can be quicksilver and elusive in nature as to reading their contours. The golfer can be so close to that four and a quarter inch hole, but still must navigate those last few feet correctly to achieve the desired result. A missed putt of a, of a few feet counts as much as a 300 yard drive. Prayers and curses are frequently heard on the putting surface. The golfer who stands before a shot requiring a water carry is another likely candidate for a quick conversion to the belief in golfing gods of some fashion. Here, in this instance, a shuffling of the feet, repeated waggles with sweaty palms and staccato breathing are forerunners to deeply thought prayers for salvation from icy waters. You see, the golfer lives vicariously through the fortunes of his or her golf ball. A splash in the pond or lake is not experienced vacuously, but is rather a terribly personal affair of shameful consequences. The golfing gods hold the fate of each golfer in their potentially spiteful grip. The wrong swing can quickly see the hopes of said golfer fall like a stone from the sky into dark waters. Such is life on the links. Extricating a half-buried golf ball from the sandy lie in a bunker is another likely grounds for religious entreaty. The golfer is equipped with a club called a sand wedge, which has been specifically crafted to meet this challenge effectively. However, many casual golfers do not know how to correctly wield this club, as it is designed to take sand and ball by striking several inches behind the buried sphere. This counterintuitive action casts cold chills into the hearts of weekend golfers and they find themselves burying blades into volumes of sand for no return. Like Excalibur was, plunged, was plunged into solid rock, the hacker hurls vast amounts of exerted energy into this pit of sand without shifting his or her golf ball. God help me. Who then are these golfing gods and do they have names? I have heard countless times the name Jesus Christ vehemently exclaimed on the links. I often silently reply, I don't think he ever played the game. Of course, this is just an example of a well-known religious figure being invoked by desperate golfers, akin to a broad-spectrum prayer in the hope of some divine relief more generally. I am sure the same thing happens on golf courses in predominantly Muslim and Hindu countries, with Allah and Krishna or Shiva being invoked. I suspect, however, that there are specific golfing gods who rule over their territory like divinities of nature. 
Golf is a game played outside amid the elements, and it is these geographical features that impact upon our games. Therefore, one must, for example, beseech a water god in the case of hitting over aquatic hazards. A short, silent prayer to a well-known water nymph before teeing off may be enough to ensure your safe passage. A nondescript tossing of a sacrificial golf ball into the pond in question may be another means of guaranteeing your dry journey to the promised patch of land or green. Some people like to mutter a prayer before their opening tee shot that goes something like this. O oh dear Lord, three things I pray. To strike thee more cleanly, to deliver thee more clearly, and to hold the green more nearly to the whole, I say, if I may, I pray. You may, of course, craft your own words of prayer to the golfing gods in your neck of the woods. Local colour is a sure sign of respect to the deity in your particular place of play. Another powerful rite or spell is, I go to the feet of the divine golfer. I go to the feet of the swing of the one true golfer. I go to the feet of the ultimate strike of club and ball in cosmic union. I am the effortless whoosh of the perfect swing. I am the ball spinning soundlessly through time and space. I am the rattle and plop of the albatross. I am golf, and golf is everything. A few incantations of this ritual prayer will see you in good stead for a few holes at least. The golfing gods only ask to be recognised for their favour to be bestowed upon you. I suppose when you think about the average golfer desperately intoning, remember, slow back and turn your shoulder, transfer your weight and keep your head behind the ball at impact. There isn't much difference between mechanical instructions and divine invocations. You have to ask yourself, am I a follower of a manual or am I a magician on the golf course? Is golf merely a game of physical actions and measurements or does it require feats of magic, especially in moments of duress? Some golfers in these high-stress moments ask themselves, what would Tiger do? Or what would Jack or Arnie have done? What would Mr. Hogan do? What would the great Bobby Jones do under these trying circumstances? Tom Morris Sr. and Jr. The lineage of golfing greats are akin to a pantheon of gods in this regard. They have ascended to the heavens where each day they play 36 holes on the finest courses paradise can muster. In those transcendent moments, during a round where players are challenged to pull off golf's greatest shots, there is a common link between us all who have played this great game. All I do is golf. Some folks say about me, all I do is golf. Now, sometimes this is said disparagingly, as if golfing is a vice akin to drinking, taking drugs, or being lazy. Golf, as those who play, as those who play the game know, is a tough sport to play. Playing a lot of golf teaches you that life is not fair. Perhaps my detractors do not approve of middle-aged men engaging in pursuits outside of work. I know that my own father was a workaholic until he got Alzheimer's disease and soon after died. Golf is but a game. Golf is a game and real life is a life and death struggle. This is the coloured lens that many look through when judging the merits of a person's responsibilities during stages of their lifetime. The game of golf is counted via the amassing of material the game of life, sorry, is counted via the amassing of material possessions and looking after family. For most folk, anyway. The Protestant work ethic does not like life being referred to as a game because it is far more serious than that, in its view. Golf may be of Scottish origin, but it is still categorised as a recreational pastime in the minds of most. To say, all I do is golf, is a deterrent to those who tread the straight and narrow path. The grass is always greener on the golf course. To men and women who feel chained to a lifetime of work and family responsibilities which prevents them from playing more golf, a life of golf can appear wonderfully attractive. Of course, the grass is always greener on the other side, especially if that side contains a golf course rich in green grass. Playing lots of golf provides plenty of exercise and fresh air, which is good for my health. Much of modern life is spent sitting down, involved in sedentary occupations. Health experts, experts know that this type of lifestyle is literally killing us via heart disease, obesity, diabetes, cancers, and numerous other illnesses. Golf is a healthy physical pursuit. 
Golf, if played without motorized golf courts, golf carts, and excessive consumption of alcohol, is a very healthy physical pursuit. I posit that if the entire population played golf twice a week and walked the course, we would be a far healthier nation. This would save hundreds of millions of dollars every year spent on saving lives through expenditure on health. Regular exercise away from TV, phone and computer screens is what we human beings really need for optimum health. Every round of golf is four plus hours and this is usually unaccompanied by eating which keeps the calories off as well. Modern life is a multitasking mega fest where we must engage in a multitude of stuff made easy by electronic labor saving devices. It is a push button touch screen type of existence. We live in our cerebral suite upstairs, leaving the hard physical work to machines and unlucky poor people. Golf, in contrast to this, is a hands on activity utilizing tools which haven't really changed that much in hundreds of years. Sure, the materials are lighter and stronger and the ball goes a hell of a lot further, but Homo sapiens still have to swing that club. To say all I do is golf is akin to a meditative mantra in many ways. It is a motto acclaiming a simpler approach to life. The arena is a grassy paradise ablaze with sunshine and fresh air. The ball lies at rest upon the fairway and awaits my best effort to launch it greenward. I check my stance and position at address. I waggle my chosen club and mentally rehearse my swing. I take a deep breath and begin my backswing. I feel my body in the correct sequence of movements. Club face meets ball and the rest, as they say, is history. Whether the outcome is the desired one or something else, I must deal with it. Golf is a game full of surprises due to the size of the playing arena and its geographic makeup. Moving a small white sphere over vast distances by striking it with a variety of golf clubs is a risk-laden adventure. Mental strength is required in addition to physical dexterity. How attached one becomes to the outcome of shots played in light of the score to par can determine how bumpy the emotional ride can be over 18 holes. If we all played golf on a regular basis in the manner I have outlined, the population would be healthier. Sure, it would be tough to get a tee time, and we would need to build a lot more golf courses. The game of golf teaches patience and adherence to process. It would quiet the minds of many via its meditative qualities amid the beauty of Mother Nature. You cannot play good golf and be thinking about a hundred other things. The game demands that the participant is present in the moment to play his or her shot. During my many rounds of golf, I observe the flora and fauna around me. I am walking amid these creatures as they go about their business. I feel the breeze as they do so too. They are involved in their survival to find enough sustenance and shelter. Sure, their activities are imbued with more meaning than mine in life and death terms, but it is a pleasure to observe them up close. Birds, lizards, kangaroos and insects all engaged in their lives. Walking with them brings me nearer to the basics of a shared life on planet Earth. If all you do is golf, which is pretty unlikely in real terms, or if you play more golf than most, then it may be a good thing for your physical and mental health. Of course, if you are neglecting your responsibilities, this is a separate issue which needs to be addressed. It does not need to be an either-or situation, but we must all honour our commitments. Playing golf requires a clear mind and steady heart for best results. The golf is not a long-term escape venue for those fleeing their responsibilities. Good communication can resolve most things, whatever the wash-up in the end from this dialogue. Golf, is it a sinister game? Playing golf under the umbrella of sunshine and rain, those of us who are lovers of the pursuit are often amazed at the presentation of the game in the media. We, who regularly toil with a small white ball within the green cathedral, find it strange indeed that golfers in the game are regularly portrayed as nefarious agents within the community at large. How many times have you seen a movie or TV show where the villains or villains are shown consorting together on the golf course? 
more than a few times, I am sure. It seems that the game of golf has become a meme for untoward behaviour in the halls of power, for it is always high-status criminals being portrayed on the fairways and greens of golfing courses and country clubs around the globe. You rarely observe the blue-collar criminal partaking at the game of golf. Golfing, a sinister activity in the movies. Golf, as performed by those left-handed among us, remains in the minority, the word sinister being derived from the Latin for left-handed. It is relevant, however, and useful to be conversant with such discriminatory labels at this point in time, because it is always far too easy to point out such divisive labels when discussing the diversity inherent within societies of human beings. Why has golf been a consistently easy target for those wishing to portray those who play the game as profligate and evil? The sins of recreation immediately springs to mind. Poor people don't have time to play golf. Only rich folk have the leisure and inclination to play something as stupid as golf. I am sure that this presumption is probably widely shared by many who do not play the game. Knocking a little white ball around vast distances of environmentally managed land is not perceived by many as responsible behaviour in the 21st century, especially when there are billions starving and barely surviving in war-torn nations around the globe. What is the ultimate validity of this argument in the 21st century? Golf is not the problem. The truth is that wealthy folk living in developed nations around the world are more concerned with their own families and situations, whether they are sedentary or not. Walking a course of some 7,000 metres and swinging a variety of clubs does not change that in any significant way. Golf, as exercise and as a sporting pursuit, does not influence that primary resolve one way or another. In countries like Australia, where land and modest wealth are profligate, golf is a working person's pursuit and not the reserve of the wealthier classes. Golf, the presidential pursuit. The overwhelming influence in the media surrounding the game of golf in recent years has been the presidential pursuit. Golf is portrayed in the media as the ultimate pursuit of our society's most elite, the President of the United States. Even the black American social worker President Barack Obama played golf and was televised doing so regularly. Presidents Bush, Clinton, Ford and so on all prominently played golf in their official leisure time. Golf was the pursuit of the most powerful among us. Power is seen as omnipotent and that power is often portrayed retrospectively as corrupt and misused. Golf is perceived as guilty by association with these powerful individuals on that basis. Golf, as those of us who regularly play the game know, is quite simply a very engaging game. It challenges us to conduct, conduct our best endeavours into an orderly sequence of doing the right thing at the correct time. Timing is everything in the golf swing, whether it be driving or putting the golf ball. If, for any reason, you are out of sequence, there can be terrible consequences for that golf shot. Standing on the tee and watching your golf ball errantly fly vast distances in the wrong direction is a sickening experience. The sensitive perfectionist can be wrought and racked by internal feelings of deep self-disgust during these moments that seem to last for forever. Trudging up the fairway and into the rough in search of your misdirected ball can be deeply humiliating. The keen golfer, however, must quickly get over this and move on to the next shot with or without hope in her or his heart. Swearing and cursing are a big part of this process in golf and not to be confused with mere unpleasantness. It's not uncommon to be on the fairway or on a shared tee and hear a loud exclamation of disgust and self-recrimination emanating from nearby. In many ways, this experience restores one's confidence in the shared nature of the golfing life. When it ain't my day on the links. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this um, segment from the golf book Green Cathedral Dreams by Robert Suda Hamilton. The book is available as an e-book in paperback and hardcover through Amazon. Uh, I hope you'll um, want to read the book further and make the decision to uh, purchase the book. Um, looking forward to uh, perhaps hearing from you. Thanks very much for listening once again and uh, happy golfing. <laughs>